Welcome to Heritage Events Live. Is election security at stake? Trading ballot boxes for mailboxes. We're thrilled to have you here. Here's some tips for making the most of your virtual experience with us. Please submit questions through the questions tab. Feel free to share your name and affiliation. We'd love to know who's joining us. You'll find a handout in the handouts tab. Download this for resources on election integrity. Finally, if there are any minor technical issues, we ask for your patience as many of us are working from home and using home internet. We hope you enjoy the program. The Constitution of the United States of America has endured for over two centuries. It remains the object of reverence for nearly all Americans and an object of admiration by peoples around the world. Not only is it the world's oldest national constitution still in use, it is also the shortest constitution, and therein lies its brilliance. Rather than concoct a detailed recipe covering every possible eventuality, the founders instead provided a structure and articulated a set of stable principles that provide a timeless guide for good governance that is enduring and worth preserving. This fall will mark the 11th year the Heritage Foundation has hosted our Preserve the Constitution series. By informing citizens on topics related to the Constitution and the rule of law, this annual lecture series seeks to restore the courts to their proper constitutional role and to enforce constitutional limits on government. Live events throughout September, October, and November will bring together leading voices in law and policy to give a reasoned defense for liberty. Previous events have not shied away from the big legal issues of the day, debating topics ranging from the state of the free press to the rise of the surveillance state, to attacks on religious liberty. Past speakers have included some of the nation's most respected judges and legal scholars, including Justices Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh, former attorneys general Michael Mukasey, John Ashcroft, and Ed Meese, and a number of senators and congressmen. We at Heritage feel it is very important for the citizenry to have an understanding of and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. We are pleased that you are able to join us for our event today and what promises to be an engaging discussion. Following the program, we hope you will visit our website, heritage.org PTC 2020, to sign up for and view additional events in our series. And now, we turn it over to our Heritage colleague to begin today's live program. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Hans von Spakovsky, and I'm a senior legal fellow uh, in the uh, Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. I'm also manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative, which is Heritage's project uh, to uh, address some of the vulnerabilities we have in our election process. And uh, welcome to the Preserve the Constitution series. Uh, I should say, uh, this was started 11 years ago by Ed Meese, former Attorney General of the United States, a close aide to President Ronald Reagan. And uh, he believed that we needed a, a series uh, around the time of the anniversary of uh, the Constitution, ratification of the Constitution, to talk about what we need to do uh, to protect safeguard and preserve this great document uh, that our country is organized on. So our session today is on trading the ballot box for the mailbox. Is election security at stake? And what I'm gonna do is ask uh, our three speakers. Uh, I see uh, Secretary Warner is already on. And uh, if I could get uh, Mark and Christian also to turn on their cameras, uh, we're gonna have a discussion about the issues that we are facing. And gentlemen, I really wanna thank you for coming. I'm just gonna give you very brief introductions. All three of you are very well known, uh, but we're gonna start with uh, the Honorable Mac Warner, Secretary uh, of State of West Virginia for the last three years. Uh, someone who, who uh, before uh, coming into that position actually had a very distinguished career uh, in the army, including serving uh, basically all over the world in, in places like Afghanistan and elsewhere. Um, he was a uh, graduate of West Point and then went to law school in West Virginia, uh, got a master's of law in the University of Virginia and uh, has done really an outstanding job as secretary of state in uh, West Virginia. Uh, then we're gonna hear from uh, Jay Christian Adams also, 
Uh, Christian is the president and general counsel of the Public Interest Legal Foundation, which is a, a nonprofit organization dedicated to election integrity, which is the topic we're going to be talking about today. A former lawyer at the U.S. Justice Department, and unlike a lot of lawyers in the election area, someone with practical experience in running elections, because uh, at one point he worked as a general counsel to the Secretary of State in South Carolina. Uh, and then we're going to hear from Mark Hemingway, uh, who is a, a senior editor at Real Clear Investigations, which have done, uh, Mark, I have to tell you, just some great work on this area, including uh, a terrific series about vote harvesting, which is a term that uh, a lot of people had no idea what that was until uh, not too long ago. Uh, Mark also uh, is a former editor at The Federalist and uh, The Weekly Standard, uh, was a writer at The uh, Washington Examiner and National Review also. So I wanna welcome all three of you here. and. Uh, the, the the format today is a discussion, and I want to start, uh, Secretary Warner, with you to ask you, uh, what are some of the specific problems you have seen in this election this year dealing with uh, COVID-19 in West Virginia, but then also, because uh, I know you're very active with the National Association of Secretaries of State. Uh, what are the other problems that you have seen on a, on a national basis that we should be concerned about in this election? Well, thanks, Hans, and thanks to the Heritage Foundation for uh, hosting this. And I was so pleased you mentioned uh, uh, Attorney General Ed Meese. I actually had a chance to serve with his son. Uh, so uh, I know that just a great American family with a great tradition of preserving and standing, putting their money where their mouth is, putting their lives on the line to protect our Constitution uh, in the service to this country. Uh, the question you ask about uh, some of the issues that COVID-19 has presented uh, that we all need to be aware of is, is first, uh, we are at this time where uh, the defending digital democracy, the, the, our elections are under attack from so many different uh, arenas. We are all aware of the Russian meddling from 2016, and that seems to have expanded now with China, Iran, and other foreign actors trying to meddle in our elections. But a lot of the misinformation that's coming out right now is coming from sources in addition to Russia and, and those places. It can be from candidates and campaigns and particularly social media, Facebook, Twitter, Google. There's a lot of misinformation that's out there and it moves in a lot of the directions towards the problems with voting by mail. Uh, the mail seems to have been a national story now as to whether you can trust the mail or not. And uh, that is what COVID-19 has brought to the fore uh, the, the, we need to provide those options. We, we should never put somebody's health at risk uh, to exercise their constitutional right to vote. So that's where a lot of people have turned to the mail, including West Virginia. And what we've done is within the bounds of law, and that's one of the key points here, is you always have to stay within your state law. These elections are run by the states and within the states then by the counties. And while people may hear of something that's happening in another state that may be working in the vote by mail system or arena, they have to take that into context that in those states, uh, perhaps they've been working on that for 10 or 15 years. If you talk to Kim Wyman and the Secretary of State in Washington and in Oregon and some of these states that are doing vote by mail, they've been working on that voter list maintenance and, and getting the proper machinery in place to, to be able to count the votes and drop boxes and all those sorts of things. But just because something sounds good in another state may not apply either legally within your state, and that's what we've got right here in West Virginia, where you can't just jump to a vote by mail system or introduce drop boxes and that sort of thing. You have to operate within the confines of the law and yet still provide flexibility to allow voters to get to the to the ballot box. And so in our situation, uh, we did op give people the opportunity to vote using an absentee ballot, but we were one of 16 states that require a voter to request an absentee ballot. We're not a no excuse and we're not a vote by mail where you simply send ballots out to everybody. And there's a lot of background I'd like to talk to about why I don't advocate that uh, because of opportunities for fraud, vast opportunities for fraud should that happen. So when somebody requests an absentee ballot, then you know that there's a live person on the other end. You have an accurate address to send that ballot to. And it worked wonderfully for us. We had perhaps the best uh, primary uh, across the United States. In fact, I was asked to testify in front of the U.S. Senate because of the high success that West Virginia had uh, during our primary, the best practices that we implemented uh, to then prepare for the, the general election. 
And so it, with the male in particular, let me give you a quick example of how the mail can be a problem. Now, I don't want to take this as an attack on the Postal Service because we've got hard workers there. They've got a great system in place. 96% of the time, by their own statistics, mail is delivered on time as scheduled to the right address. But what that means in an election year, that's 4% of the times that there could be an issue. So if you have a paper application for a absentee ballot, 4% of those may not arrive at the clerk's office on time as scheduled. Then when the clerk mails that ballot out to the individual, 4% of those may not arrive on time. When the uh, individual voter sends the ballot back to the clerk, 4% of those may not arrive on time. So you can see how this complicates uh, or multiplies the effect of inaccuracies, opportunities for human error, perhaps opportunities for fraud to occur, uh, say the purposely throwing away uh, a ballot, that sort of thing. What we found here in West Virginia, in one specific situation in our capital city, 500 absentee applications were set aside by a trainee who was undergoing uh, a training process, and then he left for various reasons, and those weren't identified for another two weeks after people had complained, we did an investigation, and so forth. So it wasn't nefarious, there was nothing wrong going on, but it was a complication that when you use voting by mail, these things do enter into the process, and can cause problems. So that, that's enough for an introductory uh, to what's happening here in West Virginia, and I'd be glad to answer any follow-on questions. Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I just want to uh, say that the 4% the figure you're talking about is uh, the, the Inspector General of the Postal Service released a report last November on the 2018 election, and in it they said that their standard for on-time delivery of election mail, which of course includes absentee ballots, was 96%. Not 100%, but 96%, which, as you say, means at least 4% of of election mail ballots may not get delivered in time. And I think that same IG report, Max, said that their worst their worst delivery times in seven states they only achieved that 84% of the time, which means that something like 16% of ballots might not be delivered in time. But if I if I can bring Christian Adams in, Christian uh, and you and Mark, if you if you'll turn your cameras on. Christian, uh, Secretary Warner talked about the potential problems in some states with inaccurate voter registration lists. And I know that the Public Interest Legal Foundation has done a lot of work on that issue. And I think you all, you all just recently released a report on that. Can you talk about that issue and some of the problems you're seeing uh, in states with, when it comes to uh, mail-in balloting? Right. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Heritage, for doing this important event every year. It's it's critically important to defend the Constitution. Uh, in contrast, uh, Secretary Warner was talking about um, uh, in West Virginia, the system they have working there. I think a great example to the contrary is Nevada. Uh, and one of the things that we looked at very carefully was the rush to automatic mail ballots in the primary where the data show that things did not go very well. Uh, take Clark County, 1.3 million ballots were automatically mailed, 230,000 roughly, bounce back is undeliverable, which means there's bad voter rolls, bad addresses, people are dead. 310,000 came back, 310,000 out of 1.3 million, and 7,000 of those were rejected as defective having some sort of problem. Those people lost their vote, probably don't even know about it, that their vote wasn't counted, uh, and therefore they were disenfranchised. If they had gone in person, those 7,000 votes would have counted. Now, Hans, you mentioned uh, uh, a research study we did. A number of years ago, Pew did a uh, research study where they looked at the voter rolls around the country and found roughly I, I, millions and millions and millions were bad. I think they said there were 2 million dead people on the voter rolls. We replicated that study at the Public Interest Legal Foundation, where we got all the voter rolls, amalgamated them, normalized them, uh, put them up against commercial data, other, other uh, private data that is out there that you can see who's alive and who's dead, who's duplicated, and so forth. And in, the, and in Nevada, for example, and I'm focused on Nevada because that's the state that rushed to vote by mail. Uh, they have thousands of people improperly registered at commercial addresses, which are not supposed to be in Nevada. And if you go to our website, you'll see a video we did last week 
uh, going to many of these addresses, visiting, knocking on the door, asking for the voter uh, who invariably is not there because they don't live in an abandoned mine or they don't live in a vacant lot or they don't live in an auto repair shop or they don't live in a casino or they don't live in a liquor store. And if you go to this video, you'll see what the state of the voter rolls are in Nevada. And so when you have dirty voter rolls on one hand and you have vote by mail automatically on the other, it equals a disaster. You can't do it that way. That's what Nevada is doing. That's what New Jersey's doing, by the way. And, and, and lo and behold, I'm sure other places will. I want to close on one last thing on, on your question, Hans, and it involves language. And I, I think it's important to reiterate something that I said to uh, another audience just recently. When people care about these issues, when people do work in this space, they're often called vote suppressors, uh, nasty names, and so forth. And my message then and my message now is do not be afraid of these labels because they're smears to try to get you uninterested in this issue. I would suggest that the vast majority of people participating in this webinar online care about this issue, want to see something done to protect the integrity of the elections. That doesn't make them a racist. That doesn't make them a vote suppressor. So people have to ignore the smears and not be afraid of them because we have a lot of work to do in this country as it relates to election integrity. Thanks, Christian. Uh, and now, Mark, Mark Hemingway, I want to bring you in. Um, I, you all, as I said earlier, uh, Real Clear Investigations did a terrific report, an investigation into vote harvesting and uh, uh, the way that has been carried on in places like Texas and Florida uh, to the extent where you had individuals going in and basically coercing, I think coercing and pressuring voters to vote a particular way um, or actually filling out their ballots for them. I, talk a little bit about some of the investigations that you all have done uh, and particularly how it relates to this push for, for mail-in balloting that we see now in this election. Well, there have obviously been a lot of complications related to mail-in balloting. I mean, done a lot of stuff, particularly on outdated voter rolls and the problems that states have had and, and keeping those um, uh, voter rolls up to date. I mean, a lot of it is building on on the work that uh, um, that uh, Jay Christian Adams has done uh, with with PILF, um, and a lot of that is you know um, been building on work that's done by other good work done by conservative nonprofits because this you know information is out there, and frankly, it's kind of shocking. Um, uh, you know, California, at, you know, has I, as of last year or so had a voter registration rate exceeding 100 percent, meaning they had more voter registrations on file than people that actually live in the state. I mean, that's how bad um, um, that's how bad voter files have been. Um, and, you know, obviously, as we transition toward mail in ballots for all the reasons that uh, Jay Christian, and I'm just illustrated with Clark County, you know, imagine what was going on in one county in Nevada, but spread that across the country. And you start to see that this is a really, really, really big problem. And it's interesting because this isn't necessarily like even an, a nefarious thing in some ways. And in, in the case of California, I think it is, you know, <laughs> that they have transparently tr resisted um, legal attempts to cause them to um, comply with federal laws that require they, they keep their voter rolls clean. But by and large, a lot of this is simply the fact that we don't spend a lot of money investing in election infrastructure in this country. It's kind of an afterthought in a lot of states. You know, I don't know, maybe um, Mac Warner can speak to that. But in a, in a lot of places, I think that's the case because we see a lot of these same problems with voter registration and things like that in, in red states and red counties. Um, and so a lot of it, I think, is, you know, simply making people aware of the problems. Um, unfortunately, as, you know, again, uh, Jay Christian Adams already hinted at a little bit, this has become so politicized and so toxic to even like raise these issues. You know, these are like fundamental, you know, good government issues that we should all agree on. And yet, you know, anytime you raise the specter of these problems, you know, you immediately get smeared. Um, and I think that's a huge problem. I, I do think, though, that we kind of turned a corner this year with COVID in the sense that there had been such a strong push for mail-in balloting, you know, sort of gradually happening over time. And the fact that this happened all at once forced people to confront a lot of very particular issues. One is that there is an incredibly high rate of, of ballot rejections when it comes to mail-in ballots. Um, New Jersey did something like 30 municipal elections in May, all by mail. And there was something like, I think it was just under a 10% ballot rejection rate 
across the state. You know, I mean, that's astounding. And then in one particular case in, in New Jersey, um, I can't claim to have broken the story. I, ca I can say that real clear politics um, and real clear investigations were instrumental in, in making it a national news story. Did expose, you know, abject voter fraud in Patterson, New Jersey, where you know the state's Democratic um, AG indicted a sitting member of, of Patterson, New Jersey's, you know, city council for major voter fraud efforts um, involving all absentee ballots, mail-in ballots, of course. So there's so many issues out there. Um, I am I both appalled and not surprised, unfortunately, that most of my colleagues don't seem to see these issues for what they are, which is, you know, a genuine threat to free and fair elections and not necessarily issues that need to be politicized in any way, shape or form. And they're basic matters of following the law of, you know, proper civic governance and 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 restoring people's confidence in the process, because you know, say what you want about, you know, whatever competitive advantage you might gain in, by in some partisan cat fight over, you know, who's suppressing votes. Um, the overall confidence in our electoral system has been seriously undermined this year. And I, I think that there are, you know, very specific reasons for that, that the media are not covering and they're not addressing. Hans, Thanks, Mark. Go, yeah, go Hans, ahead. Go ahead, go Secretary ahead. Warner. I'd like to just validate or verify what I heard from both uh, Christian and Mark, uh, beginning with uh, Christian's remarks. It's very interesting that the figures he cited from Nevada, I don't want people to think that, that Nevada is an aberration. He mentioned 1.3 million and 230,000 uh, inaccuracies uh, coming back. That's almost identical to what we have here in West Virginia. We have 1.2 million registered voters, so very similar numbers. and when we sent out these applications for the ballots, 230,000 of those came back, the exact same figure he decided from Nevada. So I'd say that may be an indication if you, you do that proportionally across the United States, that's about one sixth to one fifth of all registered voters may be, those voter registration lists may be inaccurate. And I'm telling you, this is after I'd taken 195,000 names off of the rolls. And as, as I've indicated, now that's about 200,000 that I'm expecting to take off after this election by state law, they missed the second federal election. That's when we can take it off. Think about what would have happened here in West Virginia if we had a vote by mail system where you simply send ballots out to everybody. 1.2 million ballots would have gone out. We had 450,000 people who participated. So that means there would have been more ballots out there sitting in people's mailboxes unused than there were people who actually participated. And think of those opportunities for fraud and irregularities to occur. It simply is just not a good idea uh, that's why I'll never advocate for voting in person or uh, for moving away from voting in person to a vote by mail system. The voting in person is the gold standard. It's the most secure. You're at a polling precinct where questions can be answered, issues can be addressed if there's any malfunctions. When you're sitting at home, you can vote however you want an absentee paper ballot, and I'm getting it overvotes. This is where in one county here in West Virginia, we had 1,017 overvotes. So it's a House of Delegates race where the instructions are you can vote for two and somebody votes for three. That happened 1,017 times in just one county. Those votes are now invalidated. Those, those, those votes that they thought were being cast for individuals uh, were not counted. That's why we want people voting in person, if at all possible. And that's why we've gone to these great lengths to get the PPE and to train the poll workers uh, to make sure that the health and safety of the voters are secure here in West Virginia. Everybody's going to be required to wear masks when they go to vote in person. But that's what I'm encouraging people to do is vote in person. And only if you have a legitimate COVID-19 concern, then we're making it as easy as possible for people to vote um, by, by absentee. The, the thing that Mark mentioned was the uh, more than more people than there were voters, uh, you know, more people registered than there were actual voters. We still have that uh, in two counties here in West Virginia, and that's after I've been working as hard as I can to clean up the voter registration list. When I came into office, there were four counties. After the 2018, we got two of those counties off, but because I said it's a seven-year process to get somebody removed, I'm only into one term. Let me get through the second election, and we'll get those other two counties. But that, that, think of the message that sends to the people. Can they trust the election system when you have more registered voters than you do people? No, you can't, and so that's why we... and it's the threat of lawsuits that really yeah. concern the clerks. And that's why they came to me to run for office and to run on the platform of cleaning up the voter registra registration list. So sometimes you do have to threaten those lawsuits or actually follow through on lawsuits when you have those uh, 
terrible situations where it's clearly people are not following federal law that requires the list maintenance. And that's what my predecessor did not do for eight years. And that's why it's so important to have these organizations that are the watchdogs to make sure the integrity of the elections are upheld. Well, you mentioned lawsuits, Secretary Warner, and, and I want to go to that topic with uh, with all three of you because you know the, one of the other things that you said in answer to to the first question was you talked about operating within the law, and within the law, states, uh, including West Virginia, have put in uh, certain safety and security protocols for absentee ballot in, in order to try to cut down on the opportunity for fraud and other problems. You know, many states, for example, have witness signature requirements. Um, states require you to fill out uh, an absentee ballot form that you then sign so you can again have some kind of authentication. And uh, my understanding of what's been going on across the country is there have been all these lawsuits filed, mostly by progressive organizations on the left side of the political aisle, um, trying to not only force everyone to vote by mail, but at the same time getting rid of and voiding out state laws like that, um, like saying that you shouldn't have to apply a witness signature requirement, a lawsuit in Alabama saying the state should not be able to apply its voter ID requirement. So I, I, I'm wondering, what, have you seen that in West Virginia? And I'm sure other secretaries have seen that in many other states too. We have, and it was mentioned earlier about being labeled such an, you know, voting voting uh, suppression and that sort of thing. You have to just bear with that because you are going to be attacked. I've been attacked uh, in various newspapers and so forth by letters to the editors and op-eds and so forth that by implementing a voter uh, identification law, and we, we have a very, I would say, weak uh, voter uh, identification law, but at least we have it. Uh, any number of like 17 or 18 different uh, everything from a hunting license to an electrical bill to all kinds of different things you can use. It's not a photo ID. So I think it's a very uh, weak voter identification uh, law or, or requirement. I think it's very easy. But the people in West Virginia, we are a conservative state by nature. They expect it. They want the integrity in the process. Not one person really has complained uh, legitimately about uh, having to produce an ID. In fact, most voters go in and they have the ID out that, uh, you know, uh, uh, car registration, uh, driver's license, whatever, uh, to show, they want to show that they are who they are. So you have to you have to adapt to the culture of the state. Someone may want to have, because of the history, that you have to have a notarization for an absentee ballot and that sort of thing. I don't question any of those states because of their history. history. I know that we here in West Virginia have had a checkered past with regards to election fraud, going back to the buying of the election of John Kennedy in the Democratic primary in 1960, uh, that occurred right here in West Virginia. And after that, Hubert Humphrey was out of the race. It was stolen from him. And uh, people were proud of that for decades. And, and that was the legacy that I grew up under, uh, knowing that that had happened here in West Virginia and people were proud of it. And that's a culture I'm trying to change or uh, overcome here in West Virginia by introducing and keeping uh, the voter lists strong or, or maintenance uh, to take care of that, to ensure the voter identification is in place. Those sorts of um, tactics or techniques that are needed to ensure the integrity of the election. Christian, talk about these lawsuits, because I, I know that uh, I think you all are participating in some of them, filing briefs and other things in, in this attempt to basically void the security protocols that states have in place when it comes to absentee or mail-in ballots. Yeah, let's reset this for a second. So groups who are filing these lawsuits like the harp about democracy, right? The Brennan Center or, or League of Women Voters. But let's think about it for a minute. A democratically elected legislature, let's say in Virginia, a democratically elected legislature, every one of those seats in the House and Senate passed a law that said you have to have an absentee ballot signature if you're going to do that. And they did that to protect the voter, to protect the system. That law then went to the democratically elected governor of Virginia, who signed the law, making it represent the will of the people. In comes the League of Women Voters. And they've decided the democratically uh, enacted provisions of a state election law, eh, they just don't like it. So what do they do? They file a lawsuit in the Western District of Virginia in front of Judge Norman K. Moon, a U.S. District Court judge. Uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, that, that champion of defending the statutes, Mark Herring, and I'm kidding, 
capitulates, raises the white flag. I was in on one of these conference calls because the Public Interest Legal Foundation filed a brief in the case. And I heard something I never heard before. And Judge Moon asked the Commonwealth of Virginia, do you intend to file a response of pleading? Now, anybody who's gone to law school knows that you always file a response of pleading. It's gotten so bad that the federal judge has to ask the question whether or not you even intend to file a response of pleading. So this is going on all around the country, this capitulation. It's happening in North, North Carolina. It's happening in Michigan, Pennsylvania. Anywhere you have radicals who occupy the attorneys general offices, like the attorney general of Pennsylvania, of North Carolina, of Virginia, of Michigan, you have these radicals in these offices who aren't doing what they learned in law school, which is defend state statutes. So um, real quick, you know, the U I'm also on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. President Trump appointed me in August, and we had a report come out that was going to be drafted by, speaking of radical, uh, the, some of the folks at the commission regarding how important it is to move to vote by mail. And I voted against it. I was actually the deciding vote that it never got released because vote by mail disenfranchises people. That's a fact. We know that it disenfranchised 7,000 people in the Nevada primary. It disenfranchised uh, people who, who got rejected it, it, with overvotes in, in West Virginia. Uh, we know that vote by mail has a 5% failure rate because of the post office. So the best system we can have is centralized vote in person. It's the gold standard, like Secretary Warner said, uh, and you can fix mistakes in the polling place. You can't fix them in the kitchen after you lick the envelope. I was just no, going to build on what a, uh, he was just, what, what the two previous speakers have said in terms of this year in particular, because I think of, of the COVID thing, you know, at the beginning of that, everyone thought that this was finally their chance to move everything to buy, to vote by mail. And so they, they tried to, you know, not let a crisis go to waste. Um, and the result has been just a torrent of litigation um, and, and a lot of this is being directly coordinated by the Democratic Party. Um, there's no question about it. Um, and in particular, um, you know, this has been touched on a little bit, but um, the collusion between Democrats in certain state legislatures and the Democratic Party nationally that are filing these lawsuits is really something to behold and, and really alarming. Uh, um, Jay Christian Adams mentioned North Carolina just in passing. I mean, what happened there was, you know, absolutely shocking. Remember, we're just two years out from a, a, a Republican congressional race that they had to invalidate the results and uh, hold a special election because a, a, an aide to uh, working on the campaign for the, the Republican was caught ballot harvesting, right? And North Carolina had lots of laws against that. And of course, lots of Democrats, you know, pretended to be outraged by this. Well, the result of this lawsuit um, that was filed in North Carolina, where the Democratic Attorney General in the state and everyone just in the governor just turned around and like rolled over essentially um, and erased recently passed bipartisan election laws um, um, at the behest of capitulating this Democratic lawsuit. Well, the result is now that two years later, ballot harvesting is legal in North Carolina effectively. So it's really kind of shocking how quickly this is this is moving and how this is moving in sort of a brazen and undemocratic fashion uh, that, and that the effects of which I don't think will be known yet. Um, similarly, some really radical things are happening. I don't think the American people are, are frankly aware of, but they might be in a few weeks and it'll be very interesting to see what happens. So, you know, Pennsylvania is one of the most contested battleground states. The state Supreme Court just ruled that the just completely overruled, you know, well-established state law that says all, you know, mail ballots that are going to be counted have to be in by uh, 8 p.m. on election night to say that the, that they would count mail ballots an extra, I think, three days after the election. And what's particularly outrageous about this is not just that they they completely overwrit, overwrote an explicit statute in the law that they acknowledge exists and did so using like the flimsiest, you know, grandest statements in the state constitution that don't speak directly to it they also ruled not only do you have to accept these absentee ballots um three days after the election that you can accept um absentee mail-in ballots three days after elections without postmarks so no one can prove that they were sent in before the election so if you know trump wins the state wins pennsylvania he won it by forty thousand votes in 2016 by eight thousand votes and all of a sudden 
you know, unpostmarked mail ballots in Philadelphia start showing up the day after the election, those are going to have to be counted. Never mind that we just had two fairly significant uh, indictments for voter fraud uh, in Philadelphia earlier this year, include one involving a former congressman. So, you know, this is a very, very serious concern. And I don't think that people are, are one, aware of the radicalism that has taken place this year. And two, um, this could explode in our faces in, in a couple of weeks here on election night if what's being done to liberalize all of these, these laws suddenly um, um, looks like they are being used to manipulate the vote. And, and that may, may very well be the case. Hans, let me unpack that just a little bit with uh, reality here in West Virginia. Uh, before this, uh, this this primary, in a typical election, presidential, we would have less than 7,000 absentee ballots. I mentioned earlier, during our primary, we had 224,000 absentee ballots. So you can see uh, the huge increase. That caused us to go from less than, in a typical election, less than 1,000 provisional ballots throughout the state to 10,000 provisional ballots throughout the state. Now, what that means, and a provisional ballot could occur for any number of reasons, somebody didn't sign the envelope, it wasn't postmarked correctly, that sort of thing. Now, somebody else gets to decide whether your vote counts, the Board of Canvassers. And depending on the county, the politics, uh, the makeup of the, the county commission, uh, the Board of Canvassers, they get to decide whether to count those votes. So again, you're back to that situation that Mark just discussed, if it's a close election, then those county commissioners in a, whether you're Republican or Democrat, however it is, may decide, yes, we're going to count those provisional ballots in this county because it's predominantly one political party over the other. And not it's, the rest of the state may abide by state law that says, no, we're going, not going to count them if it's not postmarked, if it didn't arrive on time and so forth. So none of us want the integrity of our, our, of our elections dependent upon a politically elected county commission and somebody, they deciding whether your vote counts or not. So that's another concern with the vote by mail process. Uh, I should mention that, in fact, that that is a real risk of uh, counties in different states applying different standards on what they will consider to be an acceptable a ballot, particularly when it comes to absentee ballots, which would bring up potential violations of, of what the Supreme Court said in the Bush v. Gore decision in 2000, which is you can't have different rules in different parts of a state on what counts as a ballot. Uh, but uh, Secretary Warner, let me ask you, because uh, this, this feeds into another question I had, which is you went from 7,000 absentee ballots to over 200,000 absentee ballots. Um, I know that the state of New York, uh, when they had their primary on June 23rd, they also, uh, officials there had encouraged everyone to vote by mail, and they had an almost exponential increase in absentee ballots, and election officials there obviously weren't prepared to handle it because it then took them six weeks to count the ballots. And, you know, the, the turnout in primaries is generally lower than, than we have in the general election. So I guess my, my question is, is there a real possibility if the election is close? that it could be weeks before we know what the outcomes are if if the new york example is repeated in other states that the election officials are overwhelmed by this huge increase in absentee ballots and it takes them weeks to process and try to count them and, and the answer is absolutely yes it, it it is going to be a problem especially in those battleground states in those states that have tried to shift to a vote by mail system uh, when they weren't prepared for it, either the personnel, the equipment, all of that. Now, here in West Virginia, we're not going to have that issue. What we've allowed is the flexibility to begin the processing, not the counting, but the processing of absentee ballots during the early voting. Our early voting goes from October 21st to October 31st. So any of those ballots, and right now we've had about 60,000 people already send their absentee ballots back in. So starting next Wednesday, October 21st, the county clerks can start checking the registrations, make sure those people are re registered, checking the signatures. They can open up the outer envelopes and get the, the ballots prepared, not counted, but prepared and stacked, ready to go by precinct. So on election night, 7.30 on November 3rd, they can run th through the high-speed counters or tabulators. And we can actually have, we had election results actually sooner during the primary than we typically did because so many people voted absentee 
and those ballots were already at the courthouse ready to be counted. We didn't have to wait for those count to be counted at the precincts and hand carried back into the courthouses and so forth. So I think we're in great shape here, but not in those states that are sending out ballots and are allowing the ballots to come in after the election and be counted, that sort of thing. Yes, we're going to have problems. And that goes to the integrity of the process and whether people trust the outcomes. And I think that's what President Trump has been railing about is we need to all be watching for these situations. Uh, I have taken every precaution I can ahead of time to notify the people in West Virginia that plan right now, if you're going to vote absentee, request the absentee right now, as soon as you get it, vote it and get it back in the mail. We've gotten that message out. We had no problems during the primary and I'm not anticipating problems. But then again, one, we're a small state. Two, we require people to request the absentee ballot. Three, we're out in front of this with allowing flexibility in a New York type situation. Perhaps they weren't allowed to start their processing ahead of time. And when you wait until uh, even canvassing before you start the counting of those votes, a lot of time and, and opportunities for nefarious activities can occur, as was mentioned earlier about in Philadelphia. Uh, we, yeah, we're going to have problems on election night and, and for the coming weeks. And uh, all we can do is count on people uh, to have their eyes and ears open and report it. Here in West Virginia, we set up an anti-fraud task force already with the U.S. Attorney, uh, the West Virginia Attorney General, State Police, FBI. We're coordinating every week on that to make sure that everybody's in place. We're notifying, making that part of the poll worker training so people know who to call should a situation arise. Uh, that's what we're doing here in West Virginia to prepare for this election. And Christian, uh, uh, going back to litigation, uh, do you foresee this uh, problem after the November election? I, well, again, going back to New York, um, and, and this is something uh, that both you and uh, Mark have mentioned, and that is uh, the very high rejection rate of absentee ballots. And in New York, after they had taken six weeks to count the ballots, they then had litigation filed contesting the rejection of those absentee ballots. And I'm wondering whether you foresee that also as a potential problem in multiple states where we have litigation over those rejections and then big fights over whether ballots that didn't comply with state law should be counted or not. Right, let's reset this. What you're referring to, Hans, are state laws as to what it, re it requires to send a mail or absentee ballot. Things, once again, the legislatures and governors agreed on in advance of the election. What you're referring to is this hostility on the left to those laws. and. They want to, and they will, to answer your question, be ready to file lawsuits to say, hey, you shouldn't worry about those rules. Those rules don't matter. Count the ballot and you'll probably have mobs with signs because that's their favorite way to get their policy advanced besides the courtroom is to say, count all the ballots, count, forget about those defective errors that violate state law that we all agreed on was the law until a few months ago. Uh, that are still on the books, uh, forget about all those rules, just count the ballots. And that's the kind of litigation that I think you're going to see in an effort in close races to muscle through defective ballots that do not comply with the law. And in places like Philadelphia and some of the judges in Detroit, uh, it would not surprise me in the slightest that these judges say, count all the ballots. And, and here's the most dangerous moment. When you start running these ballots through the tabulators, you can't take those votes out anymore, okay? Once they're blended in, they're in. And that's the sort of lawlessness that you and I, Hans, have been warning about for 10 years in this space, that the left is perfectly content with lawlessness if it gets them power. Yeah, Mark, do you, do you, you got any uh, additional insight into that particular issue? Uh, yeah, well, going back to what uh, um, uh, Mac was just saying there um, about the infrastructure and, and getting ready, um, this is a huge, huge issue. And over and over again, when I started reporting on this, and you, you'd talk to people who were trying to, you know, quote unquote, expand voting rights and, and all of these things, they kept citing the examples of, you know, I, I'm from Oregon, actually, and Oregon's been doing all vote by mail elections for over 20 years. Now, Obviously, there are still problems with any time you have an election that's vote by mail, but you just because Oregon has been successfully doing vote by mail elections for 20 years doesn't mean that you can overnight, you know, transform your state into a vote by mail state. 
In the case of Oregon, for instance, they generally do a much better job of cleaning up the voter rolls than most other states, which is not to say they still don't have problems in that regard, because they do. Um, but they generally do a much better job of keeping voter rolls up to date than most states, because when you're doing vote by mail, you know, you basically have no choice. Otherwise, it's a complete mess all the time. Um, they have very hard and fast rules about when you have to be registered by in Oregon. Like, I think if you're not registered to vote by now in Oregon, um, as of a day or two ago, you don't vote in November right now. Um, uh, you know, and a lot of people would find that appalling, you know, if that were, you know, spread across other states. Um, and, you know, just in general, they've had 20 years of building up the infrastructure um, to support vote by mail. You know, the idea that a place like New York or New Jersey was just going to like turn on a dime and conduct all vote by mail elections. What did they think was going to happen? I mean, you know, the, what happened with that congressional election dragging on for six weeks or whatever this summer was the most predictable thing in the world. Um, same with the, you know, corruption, corruption in Patterson, New Jersey. I mean, who knew? Um, you know, <laughs> these are, you know, very much avoidable problems. Um, and uh, I think if you if people weren't so focused again on simply trying to produce a desired outcome, instead of being properly focused on fairness of process, um, we wouldn't be dealing with a lot of these problems. And that's what's sort of both fascinating and terrifying to me as I've started to report on this in the last, you know, 18 months or so, uh, um, pretty extensively, is just how much the the window on this debate has shifted. Um, you need to read New York Times stories from 10 years ago, and you know there are entire New York Times stories about how everyone acknowledges that mail ballots are much more susceptible to fraud and irregularities and things like that. Um, this is just an accepted fact because it's true. And like nowadays, if the New York Times were to write an article saying that the same thing, I mean, the poor you know reporter would probably be you know shoved out a, a, a window in Midtown by his own you know <laughs> colleagues. Um, so we need to get you know similarly when it comes to vote fraud, um, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal I think 15, 20 years ago. Uh, amazingly enough, it was authored by one Glenn Simpson of Fusion GPS and RussiaGate fame back when he was an investigative reporter at the Wall Street Journal, talking about you know vote brokering and certain ethnic enclaves in Texas and other places around the country, which is a real thing that happens. You know, uh, There are definitely vote brokers uh, in, particularly in immigrant communities in this country. Um, so you know, th these are things that we, we used to be able to talk about and we used to be able to address. And now if we try and address them, you, know, you are a horrible, horrible person who doesn't want you know anyone with a different skin tone to be able to vote? And I again, I think we need to really like dial this back and get focused on civics and process, um, and general you know fairness um, instead of you know being sucked into these debates on uh, um, that that are so politicized and so bitter. But unfortunately, I, I don't know a way out of that at this point in time. It's, it's just profoundly frustrating that the moment you point out obvious facts about election insecurity, you are, in fact, smeared as racist or whatever else or, you know, not wanting people to vote. And I, I don't think that's that needs to be the case at all. Oh, I'm, particularly, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Secretary Warner. I'd like to put an exclamation point on uh, Christian's point a, a minute or two ago and the necessity of following the rule of law. And uh, here in West Virginia, during the primary, we had a statewide race. The attorney general's office on the Democrat side was decided by 167 votes. Very narrow uh, win. I mentioned before 10,000 provisional ballots across the state. In one county alone, there were 800 of those provisional ballots. Now, the populist thing to do, the thing that makes a great sound bite for a county commissioner or board of canvassers is to say, let's count them all. Let's count all those votes. We know the people. Uh, intended to sign and you know they put it in the post office didn't postmark that sort of thing so contrary to state law state law would say those votes in a number of cases should not have counted yet the county commission decided to go ahead and count those votes now the loser did not challenge this election and he would have had to you know do the legal fees uh, pay for the recounts all that sort of thing but in the general election, so there was no, he didn't challenge it, but in a general election, so let's say that had been a Republican that had won by 167 votes. You better believe that there would have been challenges to the you know, a county commission counting those votes when they shouldn't have against state law. We shouldn't have to get into that situation. We need to have the watchdog group that apply the pressure on the commissions uh, ahead of time, all the election officials, 
to abide by state law and only count those votes that are properly cast in the timely fashion in the proper way. So I just wanted to emphasize Christian's point of following the rule of law. Otherwise, these elections, uh, you just don't have the faith in them. And that's what causes the rioting in the streets. Yeah, I I, uh, I agree with all that. Although I have to mention, Mark, since you talked about Oregon, just two two quick things. And folks have heard me talk, have heard about this before. But look, it wasn't that many years ago that a an assistant professor at one of the state universities there had her students do a survey in just one county in Oregon. Uh, and 5% of the people they surveyed admitted that um, somebody else had filled out their, their ballot for them. And 2.5% admitted that somebody else had signed their ballot for them. And while that sounds like a small number, if that held true for the rest of uh, the state, that was tens of thousands of, of ballots. And the professor said she actually thought it was quite a bit more because uh, she was amazed that so many people admitted that something that illegal had happened with their, their absentee ballot. So that, so, that illustrates, I think, one of the problems with, with uh, people voting, voting at home where there's no election official supervising what's going on. So I, I don't want to like throw any of my friends and family under the bus, but as an Oregonian, <laughs> um, I, what, you, what you just said, uh, I, I have lots of like, anecdotal stories to that effect from people I know, you know, over the course of 20 years. I mean, you know, I, I, and you move, you're going to get extra ballots. People are going to be tempted. Um, you know, frankly, right. in some respects, people just shouldn't be put in that position. You know, you, you know, you should get you know, three extra ballots at, at your, at your, at your house or place of residence and, you know, be put in the position where you can be tempted to do that. You can't do that when you vote in person. Um, and, right. you know, this should be an, an obvious thing. I think that people just understand. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it is, you know, again, we should just be able to acknowledge that there might be a place where voting by mail is necessary in certain circumstances, you know, maybe there's going to be a, a crazier pandemic or, you know, you might want to even allow for mail and balloting in very limited circumstances. But we need to be able to say quite clearly that voting by mail introduces a million more problems into the process than voting in person. Full stop. This isn't controversial. It's the truth. Uh we actually got a question. Let me let me go to some questions. We don't have that much more time, but we have questions from somebody watching this. And the, the question, again, I want to start with you, Secretary Warner, is um, why aren't there more prosecutions for election fraud? You know, the Heritage Foundation maintains a database. It's only a sampling of cases. It's not a comprehensive list. We've got almost 1,300 proven cases, but but I know personally of many, many, many other potential cases that uh, law enforcement officials just weren't interested in investigating and prosecuting. And I'm wondering, as Secretary of State in West Virginia, ha have you have you had a problem with that? Because I've heard complaints from other Secretaries of State telling me that even when they have uncovered clear evidence of election fraud, when they have sent it to either local prosecutors or in some cases, state AGs, they haven't been willing to do anything about it. Have, have you run into that problem? We, we have, and it's a myriad of issues. It's everything from uh, time and resources and manpower to, to, to go do the investigation. And then once you do the investigation, when you get ready to hand that over to a prosecutor, sometimes in some of these counties, it's run by families and tight-knit uh, party control and so forth. And that prosecutor might actually be part of that tight-knit group. And even if the prosecutor isn't, the judge might be. And even if you get it into court and prove the case, then the remedy, the, the sentence is extremely light. And that only has to happen a couple of times. And then people just lose interest in pursuing, you know, spending all those resources, time and effort uh, to pursue it, to get a slap on the wrist. And we've actually had that in several cases uh, here in West Virginia. So um, we take every vote uh, seriously, every voter seriously, and every fraudulent vote, you know, disenfranchises or negates a, a legitimate vote. So we are getting after it. That's why we put the anti-fraud task force in place. But it is extremely difficult to actually move to a successful prosecution. And that's why I was so pleased, you may be aware of, in fact, the president mentioned it in uh, one of the, in the debate, uh, a West Virginia situation where a mail carrier changed the applications uh, on some, um, uh, for absentee ballots. 
The task force went to work immediately within three days or a handful of days. They had a confession from him. We did get it to the uh, U.S. attorney. The U.S. attorney did prosecute it and got the conviction. So we're pleased with that. It sends the nice deterrent message, but that's more the exception than it is the rule. So many other times we've had situations with double voting, uh, both across county lines and then across state lines, and it's very difficult for a prosecutor to justify in, in their eyes the time and expense to, to do the investigation and pursue the prosecution. So you're exactly right, but that's one of the frustrations. I think we need to strengthen election laws and increase the uh, sentencing uh, when you do move to a successful prosecution. Yeah, I'm aware of that conviction. We, we, we added that into our database not too long ago. So Christian, you've, you, you I know, have uncovered many, many potential cases of, of fraud, and how difficult have you found it to get prosecutors interested in doing anything about it? Well, it's very difficult, and there's three reasons. One, they're inexperienced in this area. A county prosecutor who does DUI and and petty larceny doesn't want to take on an election case. That's the first thing. And the, by the way, the Justice Department needs to focus on training their people uh, in, in the next four years how to do this. Secondly, fear. Uh, you know, uh, Mark, I'm very uh, uh, impressed by your desire that we all get along in this area. Unfortunately, there's hundreds of millions of dollars. And Hans, you know this, we had a full New York Times full page ad run by the people for the American way with your and my picture on it on a Sunday, which now hangs in my office because I'm so proud of it. And that's why I say, <laughs> don't be afraid of this stuff. Uh, there's fear among prosecutors that they will be smeared as vote suppressors. Third reason, and that's the bureaucrats. The bureaucrats inside the Justice Department in the election crimes branch uh, of the public integrity section. Uh, I've said the name of the person on Fox News so many times, I won't say it here. Uh, and the FBI, there are FBI agents who are from the previous administration who are still in the mindset that we don't prosecute voter fraud, because don't forget, there were no prosecutions of voter fraud during the entire Obama administration out of the Justice Department. And now there's only been a couple. There's only been the Western District of Texas, uh, U.S. Attorney Higdon in North Carolina, the case in West Virginia, uh, and Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and that's it. And that's it. In Milwaukee, we know there's voter fraud. The FBI is dragging their feet there. In the Southern District of Florida, we know there's voter fraud. The FBI is dragging their feet there. I could go on and on with the particular federal districts, and that's a problem that needs to be fixed in the next administration. Mark, in the stories that you all have done, again, going back, for example, to that great that great uh, series you did on vote harvesting, have, have you ever been contacted by any law enforcement officials saying, oh, please send us the names of the folks you uncovered doing this so we can investigate and prosecute? Oh, no. I mean, heavens no. I mean, part of the problem, though, is that as journalists ourselves, um, you know, how many journalists out there are actually interested in investigating voter fraud? I mean, like I can practically like count the number on like one hand, you know, and the kind of news organizations that actually have the resources to go out and do voter fraud. You know, like I said, 20 years ago, the Wall Street Journal was doing pieces on this. But, you know, the news side, of, at least of the, Wash of the Wall Street Journal, the news side was different. The, the editorial page wouldn't touch us with a 10 foot pole. Now. Um, you know, it's it, it is a significant problem in that. Basically, it's become a giant tautology. People say, you know, they, they, they go out of their way to make it institutionally painful for anyone, either as a journalist or within law enforcement or within the legal system, to go out and investigate and or, you know, prosecute these crimes. And then when no one is doing that, they turn that around and say, oh, there's no voter fraud. Um, <laughs> right. I mean... It's we know exactly what's going on, you know, in, in a lot of these communities, you know, around the country have historically been plagued by voter fraud. You know, I mean, you know, as Mac pointed out earlier, I mean, we're not that far removed from like actual like armed gangs stuffing ballot boxes in this country. You know, um, it, it, it really is, um, you know, part of our DNA, um, unfortunately. Um, I think things have gotten better in terms of things getting less overt. But, you know, we still regularly see voter fraud prosecutions on a, on a small level. And given what we've seen with the institutional incentives, you have to know that there's far, far more out there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's again, it's really troubling and alarming. And I, I, I'm trying to do the right thing again by focusing on the process. But, you know, just so we're clear, um, 
Uh, I do share uh, um, Adam's cynicism here about this 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 process and 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 the difficulty of getting people involved because it is nakedly political um, and it is nakedly about engineering a specific election result. I think Mark hit the nail on the head there with the um, the fact that they use because it is so difficult to prosecute, then they turn that against us and say, well, then there's no evidence of massive voter fraud. They always put that word massive in there uh, as if that's the, the important piece of this, you know, when we talk about these close elections, uh, we had a situation in Harper's Ferry uh, where just a handful of votes were not counted improperly. It went to the Supreme Court or West Virginia Supreme Court to force that. And when those votes were counted, it changed the outcome of the election, changed the whole nature uh, of the politics in, in Harper's Ferry. So every vote, and in fact, the mayor's daughter voted twice in that election, you know, to try to change the, uh, the results the other direction. Uh, so, You've got to take these things seriously, and um, the 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 whole election fraud piece of this is so difficult to get to a conviction. Uh, my frustration in the 2018 election, we had a situation in one district where I talked about the John Kennedy election being bought, you know, back in 1960. There's still problems in that area of the state. We had voter intimidation and suppression going on uh, at a precinct. We sent our investigator; he was chased off. So I called the FBI, couldn't even get somebody to answer the phone, and the FBI then later explained that they don't work on election day, they don't want to be at polling locations and be accused themselves of voter intimidation. Now that's not a, a hit on the FBI, I understand their policies and procedures for that, but my question as a state election official, if the own local authorities may be involved in the voter suppression tactics themselves, then who am I supposed to call? You know. The, uh, I, I needed an FBI, I needed an out of state or a out of that area elect, uh, official, uh, police official uh, to go into that. And we lost the opportunity to pursue that uh, because there wasn't anybody immediately responsive. That's why we've increased by four or five fold the number of investigators we have around the state. Uh, we're putting radios in their hands. We have situations where they can't even connect with each other by cell phone because of self service. So we've had to arm our people with. Uh, two-way radios and that sort of thing to try to, and, and then our approach is to try to stop it before it happens. That is, put the uh, information out, the deterrent value out on the front end with the anti-fraud task force telling people that our investigators are armed with radios, they can report these things, but I still don't have a good federal agency to go to that would be responsive on election day as it's happening, and then we're back to the situation. Once the voting occurs or doesn't occur, you've lost that opportunity you now have a less than real reflection of the intent of the people because either folks got to vote that shouldn't have or people weren't allowed to vote because of the intimidation. And it's it's a real frustration. Well, I'm afraid on that very frustrating note, <laughs> we are gonna have to end, end this discussion because our time is up. Uh, I wanna thank all three of you, uh, not only for being here today, but uh, for the great work uh, that you have done in, in all of this. and. Uh, I encourage everybody out there, uh, go vote in this election, no matter who you're gonna vote for as, as a candidate, uh, and do your best if you can to vote in person, if you're able to do that, because that's the best way of guaranteeing that your vote will count. Thanks you so much for uh, being with us today.